Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what are my favorite fields, theorems, whatever it is, a very biased collection. Um, today I would like to talk about quantum algebra and I will motivate in a second why I would like to do this. Uh, so essentially, in order to motivate it, I need to go to the next slide. So let's go to the next slide. So a few videos back I made a, uh, you don't need to watch that by the way, this will be fairly self-contained. Um, I made a video about quantum topology. And I pulled up this beautiful picture of the Congress of Mathematics, also the International Congress of Mathematicians in 1990. And Jones here in the middle happily walks away with the Fields Medal, which kind of came from this birth of quantum topology. And one of the commenters actually pointed out something I wasn't aware of, um, because there's another one in the there's another person in the picture, right? There's another person in the picture, and someone pointed out that this is actually uh, Fadeev. So let's compare. So here, um, yeah, so this picture here is of course is from uh, 1990 and this picture here is like 20 years later and not bad for 20 years actually, right? So let me pull it up. So Fadeev is a kind of a pretty famous uh, mathematician or physicist or mathematical physicist, whatever you want to um, call it from who had some really major breakthroughs in the in the 1980s and who you could call uh, one of the pioneers of the study of quantum algebra and this is where the idea for this video comes from so i was just very happy that in my little <laughs> picture from before which i can easily pull up again i finally know who this other person is it's fadeev and this kind of motivates um, this idea of studying um, the quantum groups or telling you a little bit about a quantum algebra, because as this Wikipedia article just points out, this is in, uh, Fadeev essentially is one of the pioneers of the invention of quantum groups, which were reformulated then um, later. So the kind of the story is uh, so let's just let's just look this up here. So um, so quantum groups nowadays are mostly contributed to Dwinfeld and Jimbo. So there's a famous uh, paper by Drinfeld, which we'll come back to later, and another paper by Jimbo, which talk about a certain type of um, quantization. But kind of quantum groups were invented by many, many people. Um, so, and one of the schools was kind of this Fadeev type school um, in Leningrad, where essentially the basics of quantum groups were invented, and it's somewhat down here, so that's often a very famous school, often actually called Fadeev school, but there are other really big names associated to that school. Anyway, I just thought it would be a good idea to explain a little bit about the history of this field which runs in parallel to quantum topology, uh, which you could call quantum algebra. So today uh, it will be a brief, incomplete and mostly wrong history of quantum groups, mostly because, well, what is a quantum group is a little bit of a, it, it's an ill-defined term, um, yeah, well, not much I can say. It's probably whatever I say will offend someone, but I just go for this idea that I learned from a really beautiful um, paper, which is sadly paywall hidden. It's called History and Perspective of Quantum Groups by the aforementioned uh, Fadeev. So, it's sadly, it's paywall hidden. So, Fadeev. So, there's another one which I'm also using, which is not paywall hidden, which is by Jones, the one that walks away from the Fields Medal. It's called it in and around the origin of quantum groups. Kind of very, very readable, kind of following those, and that's what I call the history of quantum groups. Again, keep in mind that it, whatever a quantum group is, is ill defined, so it kind of depends on who you ask. But anyway, those two uh, articles are very nice, and they fit into my story because they're exactly uh, the two people here in in my picture. And yeah, just, just to pull it up, um, so Fadeev. It's paywall hidden, but I pull it up anyway. So Fadeev kind of w w t t talks about this notion of a quantum group. Uh, the name apparently goes back to this paper by uh, by Drinfeld on quantum groups. And that's kind of the point here. While universally adopted now, it was considered as a misnomer by many purists. So um, essentially Drinfeld writes about this. I'm not going to explain what a quantum group is, but I'm kind of um, trying to motivate the history. So Greenfeld writes uh, in, in this paper which kind of defines quantum groups on the International Congress of Mathematics four years earlier 
that what is a whatever is a quantum group, it's not a group, not even a group object in the category of quantum spaces. So that's what for Dave kind of means was a misnomer. So somehow it's neither quantum nor a group. It's kind of a little bit of a strange thing. Um, anyway, there will be people have discovered it and there's something you can write down well defined, but anyway. So essentially what you should think of, so here as, as Fadev writes, however Drinfeld used the term quantization, it's more like in terms of deformation. We'll see what that means. And kind of so the point here where the history starts is Fadev says, uh, well, at least our perspective of quantum groups came from statistical mechanics, or as it's called here, uh, statistical physics, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so that's kind of the story. So my story here is that I finally learned who is the second person in the, in the picture, and then this kind of motivates to talk a little bit about um, quantum algebra. And yeah, as Fadev points, points out, that everything somehow should come from what is called statistical mechanics. And what is statistical mechanics? Statistical mechanics is kind of a kind of a, a, a big field of physics, which somehow captures everything. It's kind of applied everywhere. It's kind of this idea of using probabilistic methods. So you can think of like a box of gas. So you have to pinpoint the position of a particle. It's like not possible in a box of gas, but kind of you get a big picture by just looking at the overall behavior, which is pretty easy. Like the particles will on average, just spread out uh, over the box of gas. That's kind of the, the point. And I also like this to, to pull up this picture, which I forgot where I actually got it from, but it's really nice. So for a long time, I, I didn't know what quantum field theory is. I heard the name, uh, but I didn't really have any idea what it is. And then I saw this picture, which kind of places it very nicely. Well, first of all, it says statistical mechanics is kind of the, the overall box, the overall cloud that is around everything. But it also makes at least clear to me, made made clear to me what quantum field theory is. So in this uh, idea here, so if, it, if you're very slow and quite large, you end up in classical mechanics, uh, Newton type mechanics. Uh, a bit later and actually around the same time, if you're like, really, really honest, you can either increase the speed and you end up with this Einstein version of well, this relativistic mechanics. Or you can decrease size and you uh, end up with, let's say, the Heisenberg version of quantum mechanics. And then quantum field theory is just fast and small well, at the same time. Essentially, that's what it is. The quantum theory of fields, if you want. Um, anyway, this is kind of just a side remark and I just wanted to pull up um, this picture. So statistical mechanics, think of a box of gas. Mm. And what the Fadeo school and many other people were studying are so-called lattice models. You should really just think of, I'm not going too, too much into details, but you should think of some um, atoms sitting on a lattice. Uh, so kind of make it a little bit easier, like water. So usually people talk about the ice model. So this is kind of modeling kind of an ice lattice type thing. And here's another lattice. And people are trying to solve that system, like trying to find a closed kind of formula for the energy or how the whatever whatever you would like to solve, right? So like energy or something. And in those ice models, uh, it's kind of really difficult to solve them. And there was a beautiful idea, which goes r roughly back to uh, people like Temple and Leap. And they were thinking about the physicists in the 1970s. And they were kind of proposing this idea that there should be an operator, which makes it nice and easy to um, solve those problems, which, well, I now draw as a crossing, the crossing operator. And usually the crossing operator is kind of labeled with some parameter lambda or something. So a crossing type operator. So two inputs and two outputs if you want, so if you want to read it in some certain way. And they should satisfy a certain equation to make your life easier. And these equations are usually called the Young-Baxter equation. So this is kind of an, some invertibility condition. And then there's this funny looking picture which might remind you of something like the Rademeister 3 move, if you have seen that one before. If not, it's just an equation. Um, they figured out that that equation should be satisfied by the operator. And kind of the first easiest non-trivial uh, thing is, so at every point, you should think of having a, a molecule, like here, and every little edge corresponds to a, to a connection between them, a bond or something. And people were thinking, okay, a bond could be something like this. It could point in either direction, like 
we have some attracting force going in one direction, attracting force going in another direction. So kind of the easiest, the, the first non-trivial um, solution to our model should be allowing every strand to be decorated by two symbols, yeah, plus, minus, a left, right, whatever you want, something like that. And this means every string actually corresponds to a four dimen a two dimensional space, yeah, where you just think of the plus and the minus, the up and the down, the left and the right, whatever, it is as being a basis vector of a space. And then our little crossing operator, well, has well, 16 different well, states, something like out, out, something like this, right? 16 different states. So it actually corresponds to a four by four matrix. Well, 16 different states in the easiest case, kind of an attracting or repelling force for every edge. Uh, two times, two times, two times two, that's a 16. And that's why people were looking for a four by four matrix. And this, as soon as you have this four by four matrix, essentially the story should be, you should be able to solve your corresponding lattice model. In this case, it's this ice type model. So people were looking for this, like very hard, and they found a solution. So the Fadeev school uh, found the following type of solution uh, with two parameters, a Z and a Q. The Z is usually called the spectral parameter, and the Q is usually called the quantum parameter, where Q equals one corresponds to forgetting that there is quantum, so undeformed. Remember, quantization here is meant in the sense of deformation. So Q equals one is undeformed, and general Q is some kind of deformation. And if you look at the R matrix down here, so the solution is usually called an R matrix. If Q is one, this matrix is really just a a swap type matrix, um, which is kind of a boring type of solution to the young Baxter equation. But if Q is not one, this is not really a swap, it's like a little deformation of a swap. And then a more sophisticated solution uh, where you actually even keep track of this little label here for each atom, which people usually call the spectral parameter. Don't worry about that one uh, too much. And then they were asking the obvious question, okay, we now have this funny solution. So where does this actually come from? And in this, well, it, while they are trying to uh, understand where this comes from, they kind of discovered quantum SL2. So the first type of quantum group you will discover, uh, or it's FI inversion, don't worry about it too much if you want um, the spectral parameter. And everything related to some form of a deformation of, of something classical, here you deform a Lie algebra, we get a deformed Lie algebra. Everything related to that is something what quantum algebra um, would study. And there's a little bit of a misconception historically because Drinfeld eventually um, just defines. So let me uh, pull up our good old friend Drinfeld again. Drinfeld just defines uh, the notion of Hopf algebra in a quantum group are in fact equivalent. So Drinfeld essentially defines a quantum group to be a Hopf algebra. If you don't know what a Hopf algebra is, doesn't really matter. You are actually in um, extremely good, in, in extremely good company. Uh, so because Fadeev points out, it's kind of a fun fact here, uh, that Fadeev apparently gave a talk about this, uh, like before Drinfeld, yeah, in 1982. And one of the students came to Fadeev and said, oh, oh, by the way, the thing you're talking about is actually a hop algebra. And Fadeev was like, um, <laughs> at least that's how it sounds like, Fadeev was like, ah, a student has no idea what they're talking about, like, ignore that. <laughs> anyway, so kind of the, the notion of a quantum group was act is actually older than the notion of a, of a Hopf algebra, but nowadays people mostly identify um, the two as one. But people didn't know what that is, and in 1982, if nobody tells you what a Hopf algebra is, where should you get that from? You can't ask Dr. Google anyway. Anyway, so people discovered like quantum groups coming from this idea. And there's this, this limit, think of it as having a polynomial and evaluate the polynomial at one, you get like the type of classical story um, back from well, the quantum story, if you want. And how does it relate to quantum topology? Well, two of the key achievements of quantum algebra. So if I would have to pick one, I would have a hard time. If I would have to pick two, I can easily come up with two because there are really two key achievements, I think, uh, from all this quantization deformation stuff. And the first one is that, that people showed kind of very shortly after Jones, 
Uh, so like a few years later, and essentially it was already known to Jones. Uh, uh, but anyway, people showed it very formally that all of these quantum topology invariants are uh, uh, they all quantum, come from quantum groups. They are all quantum. So this is now a really strange way of writing it. So what I mean is they all come from all from quantum groups. Um, quantum groups are not quantum, so they're all quantum. is a little bit strange. But anyway, they all come from quantum groups. So this was the key achievement number one. And then there was uh, roughly at the same time there was a realization that now you have a parameter q. And you can specialize the parameter to anything you want. And that's fine. So specializing Q to 1 gives you the classical story. But there are two little bit fishy specializations. So you could specialize Q to 0 or dually Q to infinity. And since you really want the quantum usually to de be defined over uh, having an inverse of Q, both of these specializations are a little bit fishy. Yeah? You have, don't have an inverse of 0. And specializing Q to infinity is fishy anyway. But people realize that it actually makes sense if you're a little bit careful what you're doing and discovered the so-called crystal limit, which gave, gave new insights. It's really critical here. New insights on Lie algebras and their representations, which people have missed for a hundred or years. A hundred, hundred, not hundreds of years. A hundred years, because that's roughly how old Lie algebras were at that time. And that's really remarkable, right? So in this quantum, just specializing to the only fishy parameters actually works and gives you new insight um, about something people have studied for a hundred years. It's kind of a really remarkable part of the story. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.